And uh, we just want to thank you again for being here in the presence of the Lord right here. And it became uh, the church when the body of Christ came into this house. Amen? Thank you, Miss Judy, for that amen. It became the body... They became the church when the body of Christ came into the church. Amen. They came into this house. Yes. Amen. Good. All right. Well, listen, I'm excited about you being here this morning. Uh, we have the opportunity and the blessing and the prayer this morning as we install uh, one of the newest uh, members to uh, the family of our deacons. Uh, but as well this morning, I thought it was important, you know, at the beginning of the year to share with you exactly what a deacon is. Uh, to share, you, share with you the importance of that deacon within the body of Christ, within his church. I want to share that with you this morning, as we did in the first service. But I thought, you know, as the Holy Spirit was pressing upon me during that song, listen, I don't want to miss out on what the Holy Spirit has for you this morning. And I do know that there may be some in here that do not know Jesus Christ as the Lord and the Savior. And I want to make sure that I emphasize that this morning. The whole purpose of us gathering together this morning is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. I don't want anyone to leave this place not knowing that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior, that you followed Him and, and, and asked Him to be your Lord and to save you from your sin and to realize that He has the ability and the power to do whatever needs to be done in working through your life while here on this earth because of what He has done on the cross to provide for you salvation from your sin for all of eternity. He's the only one by the name of Jesus Christ is how we're saved and what He did on the cross. Amen, church? So please don't leave this place without knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You can grab me, grab one of these deacons, grab one of our prayer partners, grab one of our associate pastors. I pray that you can grab anybody in here and they can share the good news of Jesus Christ with you. We should all be able to do that. In fact, that's, isn't that actually one of the responsibilities of the church? Amen, church? Amen? Well, listen, this morning I'm going to ask for some amens and praise the Lord's while you're in here. I want you to be energetic and enthused about what God has for us today in this teaching. First, I think we need to understand exactly what the church is. And I shared this very briefly this morning with the congregation that was here. As I said a moment ago, the church is the body of believers. It's a group of people. It's not about a building. It's not about the substance of the brick and, and all of these different things that, that get laid out to give us this place to come in and worship. Although we, we need a nice house like this, and I'm very thankful for that and thankful that the Lord has provided the property and whenever His timing is to provide for us a, another facility where we can meet. But that's what it is. It's a facility. What makes it a church is when the body of believers, those who profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, enter into this house. So we are a collective unit, a body of believers, a living organism, as the Word of God says. Not a club. As I shared with the group this morning, there are a lot of clubs. I belong to some clubs. You've got to pay your dues to come in. And if they don't like you, they get you. They, they boot you out. If, if, if you don't pay enough money, they boot you out. But I'll tell you what, this is a growing organization. It's not restricted by any race, by any gender. It is through the name of Jesus Christ that we call ourselves the church. And I'll tell you what, it's an ever-growing group. In fact, that should be our desire to grow this group, not to keep it just within ourselves. I shared with a group this morning, one of the worst things you can ever say to a pastor, I pray that no pastor wants to hear this, is that we want to keep this just about us. You've never said that, have you? No, we want to see this group grow, amen, church? We want to see this body grow. So how do we do that? We go out and we share the good news of Jesus Christ. So the church is a body of believers, followers of Jesus Christ. It's a spiritual organization. It's, it's a group that's ever-growing in its faith in Jesus Christ to become effective, not only to one another, but effective within the community, which takes us to another part. We're to be a mission enterprise, if you want to use that word, a mission entity. I hate to use the word organization. But the reality is we're to be mission-minded, outreach-minded. Again, it takes us to the fact that we're not to be just about us. It's all about Jesus, right? It's all about winning others to the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's all about growing in our faith. In fact, just a moment ago, you heard Stuart as folks were coming in, and he was sharing with you that we're getting ready to, to launch uh, the Purpose Driven Life, and we're going to go through a series within the body of this church to grow us in what God wants us to be, not only as individuals, but also as the body of believers. Amen, church? 
So it's important for us to be mission-minded and outreach. And how many of you found it to be a blessing as you went out these past couple of months and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and meeting the needs of others? Maybe some of you in this house this morning have been a recipient of that. And that's why you're here, because someone took the time to care about you and to love on you. In fact, isn't that important for us to do that? Before I can share the gospel of Jesus Christ, isn't it important that I assist and help in meeting a physical need? In fact, how can I bring a spiritual need if the physical need's not being met? Amen, church? If someone's hungry, how can I share the good news of Jesus Christ if their belly's growling? I need to meet that physical need as well. So we need to be mission and outreach-minded. And I'm so thankful that this body of believers here is exactly that. And as we continue, we look at the church as being one that's a steward of the resources that God has provided for us. As we looked at the the budget from last year, and we look at this year, we see how God has allowed the resources of this church to grow and, and how those resources are placed and put into the lives of other people. Wouldn't it be great? Listen, hey, wouldn't it be great if the church went out and bought a yacht and we just went on that yacht and just enjoyed each other's time? Come on. How many of you want to do that? Don't raise your hand. Hey, listen, how many of you would like to buy your pastor a Gulfstream jet? All right, I'm not going to get on that one. Your pastor doesn't need a golf dream jet, and I don't need to go buy my wife a Ferrari, okay? Some of you have been watching the news. You might know what I'm speaking of. And pastor, if that's you, I'm talking to you. Amen? We need to put the resources where God wants them to be put, and that's to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? So we need to be good stewards of the resources that God gives us in providing for the community and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one of the things as well is, although we are called Fellowship of the Hills Church, let me just give you a tidbit of information here. It ain't just about us. There are some wonderful churches right here in Union County. Amen? In fact, I meet with six, five to six of those pastors every Tuesday, and I love fellowshipping with them. I wish that our prayer is that all of the pastors would come together at least once a month. We meet every week, those five or six of us. We pray over one another. We love each other, pray for the ministries and, and the congregations that God has entrusted to our care. But my prayer, as well as those that we meet every Tuesday, is that all those other pastors could come together at least once a month and, and pray for one another and love on each other. Because you know what we have figured out? It's not about us. It's all about Him. Amen, church? It's all about Him. You see, although we are an independent church, when I say independent, we're called Fellowship of the Hills. As I share with that group this morning, I pray that you're here to hear the Word of God. I pray that you're here to worship. I pray that you're here to serve. But part of why you're here may be because of the flavor of the worship, the flavor in how the message is delivered, maybe the flavor in how we serve. Maybe we do more outreach. I don't know, but, but God placed you here for a reason to serve in this local church. You're committed and a member of this local church. It doesn't mean that you separate yourself from other churches, other body of believers. In fact, does it not mean that as we, we should as well work with other fellowships? Amen? Of like faith, that believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Should we not work with them and love on them? Amen, church? Isn't it amazing that when we go to heaven, we're all going to be up there together? You're not going to have the Baptist section, Methodist, Presbyterian. You're not going to have them. I know some of you say in fellowship have its own, own group, right? No, we're going to be worshiping with, with each other. We're going to love it on the Lord. We're not going to care about all of that stuff. Amen, church? So will you pray that, that although we are a local church, and, and, and again, maybe you're here for some of those reasons because of the flavor. I shared with a group this morning, I love Southern gospel music. I just love it. Just love it. Need to sing more of it. But anyway, we love it. I'm playing with you, Stu. I love good contemporary music as it relates to praising the Lord. I love the hymns. Shall we gather at the river? You all know that song, right? Amen. Yeah, okay, you're all singing that song now, right? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I love that song too, right? Oh, man, I, I could go on and on and on. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. How many of you know this song? Trust and obey. But I could do this all day. Uh, yeah, I love all those old hymns, right? Amen. I love those. Then this morning, I got up and I handed Stuart a new song. New, no, it was a new, new song to me. I was watching Dr. David Jeremiah this morning, and Brother Billingsley, he got up there to sing, and he was singing that song, Glory, Hosanna, Jesus Saves. 
Man, I got myself singing that song as I was getting ready for the service today. I came in. I wrote it on one of my business cards. Did I not, Stu? Hand it to Stu. I said, you guys got to learn this song. I love this song. Pastor has his prerogatives every now and then, right? But sometimes we have different flavors of music. And sometimes folks can get so caught up in whether it's not the right beat. Why not get caught up in praising the Lord? Amen. Some folks get caught up on how the message is delivered. You know, the Word of God says His Word never returns void. As I was sharing with the group this morning, I've been to a lot of training classes. There are some classes that just had great material. The material was awesome, but the person delivering it was terrible. Well, at least I thought. Because it wasn't my flavor of how it was to be delivered. Does that make sense? And some could, set, could have sat through that class and loved how it was delivered. Well, that's sometimes in the presentation. But you see, the Word of God shall not return void. So I pray that, that maybe if you came this morning and you don't like the delivery, that my prayer is that the Holy Spirit speaks to you through His Word because that's what's supposed to happen. Amen? So, again, we have different flavors. But we should not be separated because we're different local body of believers. I'm thankful that you're here at Fellowship of the Hills, and I'm excited about how God has brought you here and how you're serving. But let's not ever forget that we got other brothers and sisters, and we need to work with them and love on them. Amen, church? So as I've explained just very briefly in what the church is and, and how we're to follow God's command for how He wants us to serve and, and do His work, He also gives us those that will help in this ministry we call Fellowship of the Hills. I'm thankful for Clayton, and I'm thankful for Stuart, our associates that we have here on board that have those belly wicks that God has assigned them to. I remember when Susan and I uh, planted this church several years ago, uh, not only to be, to be cleaning our house and cleaning the other facilities, but to be leading the music. How many of you were here uh, many years ago when, when uh, we were up here singing canned music? You don't know what I mean by can't. Yeah, Gary's back. Yeah, I know. Can't, you know, we, we had all the tape songs up here, and I was up here sweating during that time, and we had others. Uh, and sometimes being the chief cook and bottle washer can be kind of tiring sometimes, but what a blessing it was to be a part of that. So I'm thankful for Stu and the praise team. I'm thankful for how God brought Clayton and helps us with our evangelism and our outreach, and, and uh, to say, Clayton, run with the buckets, run with these things and what God's doing. Amen, church. And for our children's ministry, what a blessing it is to see Mike and Deanna and all those helpers up there doing what God's called them to do in working with our children. Very important part. And to see what Jeff is doing, he's so busy, uh, not only with his own job and, and also as one of our deacons, but also working with our youth. We've got an ever-growing youth program in this church, and I'm excited about what God's doing here. I was excited to have Jacob. I hope I don't embarrass you. Jacob walked up, a 17-year-old walked up, and he was sharing with me, Mr. Jeff asked me to teach a class to the youth. Man, I'm excited. Isn't that great that, that our youth pastor is helping in growing our children and our youth to, to step out and to serve God as well? My challenge with the children's ministry as well and with our youth, I pray that one day, that I'm looking forward to maybe once a quarter, we can have them come up here and have them do the whole service. Wouldn't that be cool? Who knows, Jacob, you may be preaching the next message up here. Hey, man, wouldn't that be awesome? But God has appointed those to help in the ministry of the church. Contrary to popular demand, the preacher can't do everything. And I can assure you this, if I... Try to do everything that's going to wear me out, burn me out. And that at times has happened, I must confess to you. I remember it wasn't too long ago. I didn't share it with this first group. And again, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit reminds you of things. Susan, I see you're sitting in the back, but it's been about five or six years ago, honey, maybe seven. Susan and I took a ride down to Fort Lauderdale. We were right about three years or so into the plan of this church, and we were in our second location and been praying for so many things, Stu, you being one of them, not personally, but that ministry and so many other things. And uh, I remember on that ride up there, and I remember as Susan and I were praying, one of my prayers was, Lord, I'm tired. I can't do this anymore. I need help. And Susan was over there, and she was praying, Lord, we need help. We can't do this by ourselves. We went down, and we prayed with another pastor, and prayed with that group, and I'll never forget Pastor Fidel. Fidel Gomez, as we were sitting and we were praying in that room right before their service, and uh, he handed me a dollar bill after he had written on it. And he said, Marty, what are you going to do with this dollar bill? And I jokingly said to him, I said, I'm going to put it in the offer plate. He says, why would you do that? And again, 
I said, well, because it wasn't mine. I haven't lost anything, so I'm going to put it in the offering plate. He says, now I want you to read what I wrote on it. You know what he wrote on it? And I've never forgot it, and I have that dollar bill to this day. And from time to time, when I get tired, feel a little wore out, a little burned out, I pull it out, and what he wrote on it, he says, never forget, they belong to God. Never forget, they belong to God. You know what that reminded me of? Is that my most important responsibility is to teach the Word of God. It's to set the table to present the meat so you can dine at what God has for you. What he was trying to share with me is don't worry about the little things. Don't worry about how many people come forward. Don't worry about all of these things that are on the outside. You do what God called you to do. And from that moment on, Susan and I left there. And I've never forgot that. I'd been in the ministry and pastored two churches, but no one had ever shared that with me. In all of my seminary, no one had ever shared with me. Let it go and remember that they belong to God. They don't belong to you. You see, I was worried about whether people would come in and work and serve and help. In fact, there were those that would come at times through the course of the ministry, and then they would want to go on. And I said, Lord, what are we going to do when they leave? I get so worried about those things. But I'm here to tell you, church, I'm excited about what God's doing and how He has worked in my life. And I want you to know that your pastor turns it over to Him. And I pray and I entrust God to provide and to, to put people in place that will help me in this ministry. Not walk behind me, but walk beside me and to help in the ministry of this church. Because I can tell you, I cannot do it alone. And God knew that all the way back when, did He not? Did He not? In the birth of the church, as we see the New Testament church there in the book of Acts, did God not know that there would need to be those that would walk alongside, alongside of the apostles to help and to be a part of that ministry? And I'm so thankful for the many of you. But this morning, I want to share with you about the responsibility and the call of the deacon and how important they are to not only me, but also to this church body. And I am taken to the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6, verse 1 through 7. I want you to follow along with me this morning. It's up on the screen. I want you to also make some notes this morning as well. In Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7, it says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose among the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native uh, Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. Now I want to pause for a moment. Have you ever come to a place or, or found yourself in the church where you felt like nobody knew you? Nobody was paying attention to you. You felt like you were all alone. You felt like the deacon didn't care about you. You felt like the pastor didn't care about you. You didn't even know who the associates were. You, you just didn't feel like you were a part of the church all alone. You ever felt that way? Come on, be honest with me. Anybody ever felt that way? Good, good. Well, I want you to know my prayer is that you will never feel that way here at Fellowship of the Hills. Because let me tell you so what, number one, you're important to God. I've already shared that with you. Important. Number two, you're important to me. I may not be able to be there all the time, but you're important to me. And I promise you, I will do my best to love on you and to be there when you have a time of need. But there may come a time where I just can't do it. I just can't, I just can't be all places at one time. My prayer is though you'll never be overlooked, that you'll know that there are others. There are these deacons as well as others that will be there to be your comfort. But at least, as we talk about the deacons this morning, to know that each and every family within this house has been assigned to, to, a, to a deacon and his wife that, listen, that they're going to love on you, they're going to pray for you, they're going to keep track of what's going on in your life. And let me know so I don't lose anybody. You know, we've got exponential growth in this church, as I shared a moment ago. The life of a church, as we see, is, is it growing. Amen, church? It's in its growing, growing and reaching others in Jesus Christ, growing and discipling others to go out and do the same thing, growing in its evangelism and outreach and loving on one another as well. But this is what was taking place back there. The, uh, the apostles, you can just picture them, they, they were over here and maybe trying to build this church, maybe trying to take care of this, and, and all of a sudden these folks felt as if they were getting left out. So what did they do? What happens when somebody gets left out and doesn't feel like they're a part of something? What do they do? Well, they start complaining first, do they not? It's been almost 18 years in the ministry, and I tell you what, there's not a week that goes by that sometimes I don't get those calls about someone that feels missed. Am I, am I wrong, brother? I got a brother pastor right here. That happens from time to time. Sometimes I get a phone call. I pray this never happens. I don't know who my deacon is. Never met my deacon. That won't happen after today. 
Amen? Amen. Here's the deal. The Lord recognized, as we see this this morning, that there needed to be those within the church that would help in those important parts of the ministry. And that they wouldn't be overlooked. As we continue in verse number 2, notice it says, So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Let me ask you a question. What's the most important thing that God has called me to do in this house? Let me ask you a question again. I think I heard it. What is the most important thing God has called me to do in this house? To preach the word. To preach the word. To proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. To preach the word. To pray. A lot of things that happen through the course of the week. I was sharing with a group this morning, and Mike is upstairs as he's, as he's teaching with the children and the children's work. He's also our trustee, and I'm so thankful for our board of trustees. We met this week with engineers and with bankers and praying what God's going to do on that piece of property. Sometimes as the pastor of the church, that's also necessitated as well. But I'm very thankful that I have a group of, of those trustees that when I walk away from that meeting, those things are taking place. No micromanagement needs to take place. That they're doing what God wants them to do. Same thing with the children's ministry. I don't need to micromanage the children's ministry. I've got those up there that I can entrust and know that the Word of God is being proclaimed to those children. Amen, church? What a blessing it is to know that it was amazing. Susan and I came here yesterday late in the evening as we walked through those doors. The place was clean. It was amazing to be able to look at Susan. Hey, guess what, honey? We don't have clean church no more. We've kind of joked around about that over the last few years. What a blessing it is to know that we have families that come and take care of cleaning the church. You know, in the last several years, I can't remember anybody walking up to me and telling me that there was toilet paper missing in the bathroom. That's been a blessing to me. I can't tell you how much that means. Amen, church. You know why? Because they said, listen, it's not desirable for us to neglect what God has called us to do. In verse number 3, it says, Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, who may be put in charge of these tasks. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. This morning is... Some of you have said to me over this past year, and as our, again, the exponential growth of the church says, Pastor, we don't know who all the deacons are. Can you introduce them to us? And I'm going to do that this morning. Joel did that last week. I'm going to introduce them to you again this morning. I'm also going to introduce one, which we introduced last week. I'm going to introduce one that's coming on board as one of our new deacons. And each one of these men are assigned at least 10 families. And as the church grows, they'll be assigned more to help. So no one gets left out. So that's what they did here. The church uh, selected these men that would be a part of working in this ministry. And it says in verse number 6, And these they brought before the apostles, and after praying they laid their hands on them. And notice verse number 7. Don't miss this. It says, The word of God, the word of God, kept on what church? Hey, let me ask you a question. Isn't that what we should want to see? Shouldn't that be the desire of this church body? Shouldn't this be the desire of Fellowship of the Hills? That the Word of God continues to spread. Let me tell you what, it's not about the glorification of Marty. It's not about the glorification of any of these others that are in the ministry, Stuart or Clayton, or children's ministry, or D. It's not about the glorification of any person. In fact, if it's about glory, we are doing the wrong thing. We're not serving God, we're serving ourselves. This is a calling. I remember not too long ago sharing with Clayton, he was sharing with me about someone that felt as if they were called to the ministry. And I remember sharing with Clayton that sometimes I hear, I hear things like this, and I have to be honest. Sometimes I hear about someone that's called to the ministry because they can't find work. You're not called to the ministry because you can't find work. Amen, church? You see, I had a good job, had a great retirement. I could rock and roll and do other things in other parts of this world. And Susan and I could be spending time with our grandchildren, eight of them, by, by the way, that we did not see over the Christmas holidays. In fact, we haven't seen what now, honey, for about eight months. And we're looking forward to seeing them every now and when you get a FaceTime. <laughs> My little grandson called me on FaceTime the other day. I still got to figure out how that thing works. 
I'm pushing all kind of buttons. I can see his face. He said, Pappy, I can't see you. I said, oh, okay, turn around this way. So I'm chatting with a little eight-year-old who's telling me how to work a phone. You know why my little grandson called me? I finally gave up, all some, I gave up some of my boy toys. I was a Miami Dolphin fan for a while. And I had all these little toys, little Miami Dolphin footballs and jerseys and stuff like this. And Susan says, you don't need that anymore. I said, you know what, you're right. I don't need that stuff anymore. And I packed it up and I mailed it down to him because he's a little Dolphin fan. He plays football. And he was calling me because he opened it up. And he was so excited about that. I wish I could have handed it to him. But here's where I'm going with this. God's got a call on my life. I've got to be honest with you, there are some times that I'm not in the pulpit and I miss it. I miss being with you. And Susan sometimes will say, honey, we need to take a break for a little bit. I love it when she says, they'll be okay. They'll be just fine. It's tough, isn't it, Clay? It's tough, isn't it, Dan? You know why? You know why it's tough? Because it ain't a job. It's a calling. It's a calling. And they recognized that. They recognized the calling that God had on their life. And they were fearful that, that they were going to miss out on doing what God had called them to do. So I'm very thankful this morning as I introduce these men that step into the plate, that step in away from the shadows and help, and, and they're a part of this ministry, a very important part of this ministry to me and to you. I narrowed it down in three different roles in three different areas. You look at it on the screen. This is, this is what this means to me, assistance to the pastor. You know what? Uh, there, there's not a week that goes by that, that Miss Judy, who works our prayer chain, puts everything together, makes sure that, that we as the deacons know what's up to speed and up to date with what's going on through the course of the week. And those men get online on a conference call that Niall negotiates and works for us to have that, have that line. And Tuesday nights, those men spend anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour in prayer for you and for the ministries of this church. I'm so thankful for them. I'm thankful for how they support and they pray for your pastor and Pray for your pastor's wife and how they step in to minister with me. Because they truly are, as I've got a number two of these bullet points, servants of the church. God is number one, but they serve you at God's authority. And then number three is they're also witnesses within the world. You know what that means? Good reputation, good report, spiritual men. They are those that go out and they're not afraid to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm thankful for the one that I have standing back here to my right, your left, in Niall and Judy as well, who, who not only take upon themselves to be ministers within the deaconship of this church, but also are traveling as ministers with Evangelism Explosion. I've already shared with you Jeff, who, who is part of this deacon ministry, who has taken upon himself to, to work with our youth. And Brother Joel, where are you, Joel? I look for that big poofy white hair when I look back there. Oh, he's been with Susan and I, him and Ellie, since almost day one. And even through some of the health issues and things that has gone on in his life, you know that man loves you, and he loves your pastor. Even in his pain, he'll call, and he'll check on me, and he'll check on you. And I love it from time to time, he'll throw out a little email to the guy and say, all right, this is what you guys need to be doing. I love it. He's great. He was a great manager in his secular line of work, and he does a great job. You guys wear coats. Be there to help out. I love it when I see those men. Those are wonderful. And then he'll say, hey, you call in your people. You're checking on them. And I love it. Why is that? Because he's a man concerned about his calling. I, I could go on and on, and I, I see Brother David back there, and he's staring at me in the screen right now, wanting me to stand still so he doesn't have to keep moving that little camera. I hear that from time to time. I love to just play with him on that. I darted over there one Sunday. He said, we lost you. I said, you've got to pay attention more. And there he is back there working that camera. And him and his lovely wife, Kathy, and what they do in the ministry of this church for so many years. And I could go on and on and on. Brother Johnny and Lucretia. Brother Dan, a fellow pastor who's, you know, isn't it amazing that a pastor would be a deacon? Isn't that kind of weird? He's like, well, you don't understand, I was a pastor of a church. 
church. What do you mean you want me to be a deacon? Isn't that like a step backwards? No, it's not. You know why? Because it's a calling. God has him and Judy here at Fellowship of the Hills, and there's a calling. And even through all of the physical things that Dan's been going through, what God is doing in his life. And again, I could go on and on. Brother Bruce back there, just such a tender guy. He's a big man, but very tender in how he speaks. Very soft in how he loves on others. Him and his lovely wife, Joy, and I'm so thankful for them. I'm thankful for the reputation he has in our community as, as one of those that works with his hands. The Word of God says men of good report and tested, and it's a blessing to know that there are those within your deacon body that represent our Lord and represent you well and how they minister in their jobs. Thankful for them. I want to introduce one to you now who's going to come up and share, your, share his testimony. And as he knows and I know, and as you've already seen, the Holy Spirit changes things from service to service. I know how much his testimony touched me in the last service. He as well, at one time, was a pastor. And I'm so thankful to have George and Kate. George, if you would, come and share with us. As I started off earlier, I'll throw this out and then I'll tell you why. And Marty asked me when I do this, and I said, uh, yes, sir. He said, well, you got two to four minutes. I said, well, thank you. And he said, and then I, I sort of thought about that. Is that two or four minutes of his time or two or four minutes of Clayton's time? And there's a big difference there, you know, when they get to talking. But sometimes when you get to talking, someone else takes over. And when that happens, there is no time frame with him. That's right. But he asked me to, to sort of do it. It's sort of hard to do it because the older you get, you sort of forget. But I was a young man. My father, he was in service. He was in World War II in Korea. He was overseas. And I accepted the Lord. I'm not sure, around 10, 11, 12, baptized in a river or a creek, I mean, or a lake. But I said, Lord, please bring my daddy home. It was amazing how he did. My daddy, he, he drank, he smoked, he did most everything the old army guys did. But he loved us. He loved his family. He looked after us. He took care of us. A little later on in life, he had cancer, colon cancer. And took a great toll on him. But he looked at me one day and he said, boy, I'm proud of this. I wondered in my heart and soul how he could be a proud of a hole in his side. He said, because God used this to give me time to spend with him every morning reading my Bible and listening to what he was saying to me. That stuck with me the rest of my life. Sometime I would forget it. Then he finally died. He died of an aneurysm. But before he died, he always told me about, hey, I love you, George. I know you've done things wrong. I've tried to tell you what's right. He had a saying that he used to say to me. He said, you know the reason I tell you all of this? You know the reason I share it with you? I said, no, sir. I don't understand why you share it with me and then whip me. I said, I just can't understand that. He said, because I told you beforehand, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. And then you did it, and that's what happened. Didn't think about that then until I came along and had children of my own, and then I realized what it was to whip a child. First time I whipped my son, I went outside the building and cried like a baby because I said, you big brute, what are you doing hitting on that kid? 
So in my life, I, I, I've shared a lot of things, or I've, I've had a lot of things shared with me. And then as I grew older, I got married, like everyone else, most of us. And in that marriage, I got in trouble. Not my wife's trouble, not my children's trouble, my trouble. And the Lord, I was separated from my first wife. I've been married twice. And one night I was in his friend's house, and God said, what are you doing? Trying to sleep. He said, get up and go home. Man, it's hard to do after what I've done. He said, get up and go home. So I went, got up and went home. And then shortly after that, I felt in my heart he was telling me, I want you to tell people. I want you to share with people what I've done for you. You don't deserve it, George, but I did it for you. And then back here, the thoughts of what my daddy told me. I did it because I loved you, George. I whipped you because I loved you. And then the Lord was saying, you made some mistakes, George, but I'm going to forgive you. And I want you to go tell other people. Well, like Brother Marty said, sometimes the Holy Spirit takes over. I didn't have the educational background of a preacher. I didn't have a seminary. I, I might have knew three-fourths of the books of the, the Old and New Testament if I could look at them. But he didn't ask me what I knew. He asked me to go. I said, okay, Lord, I'll go. And in that process, he called me to a church, first church that he called me to. It was a country church, and as I shared this morning, it had an outhouse for a bathroom. Well, most people nowadays don't know what an outhouse is, but it's out in the country. So he said, uh, build a bathroom, so a bathroom was built. Shortly after that, I was asked to leave that church. And then for a few months there, I didn't preach anywhere. I didn't serve anywhere. I just sort of wandered and went back to a little church that we were going to then. And then I got called to another church. I didn't understand why I got called to another church after I'd messed, not messed it up, but left that church. Um, and I think it was the first little revival. We hadn't been there very long. The right hand side of the church fell in. I mean, the floor just fell out. Well, everybody got up and moved over to the left side, except one guy. He said, I'm not moving. And that, I guess, was what the Lord was saying. It's time for this church to build on. It's time for this church to upgrade. And he built a new church. And I was there for a little while, and then I was left. It's hard to stand up in front of people and say what you were without being able to stand up in front of people and say, but God forgive me. And praise God that he did forgive me. Then after that, the times got rough and I ended up with a divorce. It was hard. It was hard on my family. It was hard on my wife then, it was hard on my kids. And then for a year or so, I didn't do anything except work. And then the Lord sent someone to me, and, and I'm going to tell you this, and then I'll try to get right to the story. This friend of mine, where we worked, we were out in his shed, so to speak, at work, and this lady walked across the parking lot, and um, I said, Hey, Nelson, I'm going on a weenie roast. Want to go with me? He looked at me like, why in the Sam Hill I go on a weenie roast with you? He said, why don't you go ask that woman? I said, okay. I went and asked her. A few months later, we got married. So you see, the Lord has a way of doing things. But, but I tell you that story because... He knew I needed help, and he knew that I was someone that could help me and comfort me, and he sent her to me. And she's done that over the years. She's really been there for me. But you know, one of the hardest things, I think, for us as, 
is to realize that we're human. We fight every day. And just what Brother Marty said about some of the people here, the deacons, the, the individuals that are going through trying times right now, we all do that. We all have that problem. And I think in my heart, and my soul, when he stood up here before he started with the message and said, hey, there's people here who have problems. There's people here with anxiety or worrying. And I think he said that to me because I was fighting. And we have to lay it down. It's easy to lay it down, but when you get up, you can't pick it back up, and that's where the problem comes in with all of us. But I'm thankful that we were sent here to this church. You say, who sent you? Jesus. He sent us here because when we first came up here, we visited around. And then all of a sudden, one day we came into here and, and we saw the sign and we came in and we visited. And I noticed something that was very unusual here. It wasn't that people didn't look at you or shake your hand. As I told Brother Morty, it was when the person come over and he put his arm around you. He said, I love you. He didn't do that because he had to. He did that because God told him to do it because you needed it. That's something this church is well known for in this community. And that's caring for one another. Man, how, how we need one another to care for one another. Because it's hard to go to a, a fight with a knife when the other man's got a gun. Well, I, I'm just thankful that God has not only got the gun, he's got the knife and he's got the answer. And that answer is his son, Jesus Christ. And I just thank the Lord that we have fellowship here with, with one another. And we try to reach out and, and serve others by letting Jesus and the Holy Spirit use us to do that. It's a great honor. I thank you for the opportunity to do this. I need your prayers. I need your love. And I need your handshake. And if you're going through trouble, and you're going through trials, there's a verse this morning I read. It says, cast your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Boy, how I needed that. He cares for you. But you know, sometimes it's hard to realize how God could care for me. You say, why not? Because you don't know what I've been, and I don't know what you've been, but he knows what we've both been. And he offered us his hand by saying, Come unto me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. We have to fight on that every day. So, Brother Marty, I appreciate it. And I ask you for your prayers. I ask you to, to guide and direct me as I. Take what God's given me and try to share it and help you. Amen. And thank you, Reverend George. <clears throat> you know what I love about each of these men is they're not afraid to share their hearts. It takes a lot for a man to stand up and tell you about some of his faults in an open church, does it not? Some of us like to kind of keep that hide behind a bush. But we're all real, are we not? We all face at times adversities and things in our life. And you know what I'm thankful for? That I've got a Jesus, number one, that saves me. And I'm thankful that i got a Jesus that walks with me and walks with me through the fire. I love that story with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And my goodness, I could go on and preach another message because that's what I love to do is share the gospel. But I remember the story of those men and when the king threw them in there. And he said, don't just crank up the heat. Crank, crank, crank up the heat. And isn't it amazing when they opened the, the furnace? They looked inside and they said, well, wasn't it just three men we threw in the fire? 
Well, I see four in there. One of them looks like the Son of God. Isn't that amazing? So no matter what fire we go through, no matter what trial we're in, aren't you glad that Jesus walks with us and beside us? I'm thankful for these men. I'm thankful for how they have shared with me, and I'm thankful that they're real and that they will walk with me and that they will love on you.